Good afternoon, everybody. Hi. Uh, it's my pleasure to call the meeting to order and to welcome you all to the 40th Annual General Meeting of the Members of the Symphony Nova Scotia Society. Uh, to start off, I'd like to ask Kathleen Franklin, who's speaking on behalf of Brian Rendell, the Treasurer Secretary, to confirm if the number of voting members present and proxies received meets or exceeds the requirement for quorum, which is 15 members. Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, and Kathleen, can you please confirm that public notice was posted August 30th, 2023, and that members were notified September 25th, 2023? Yes. yes, they were. Thank you. I now declare that the meeting is duly constituted and the requirement for forum was met for the uh, members of the Symphony Nova Scotia Society, and it is called to order. I'd like to start off by acknowledging that Symphony Nova Scotia's performances and events take place in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. First up is an approval of the agenda. Uh, the agenda would have been uh, distributed when the materials were out. Could I have a motion to accept the agenda? Okay, 
Thank you, David. I see a second, Jane. Thank you, Jane. Um, all in favor, please raise your hand. And any opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Thank you. Next up, you'll see that the minutes of the 2022 AGM are included in your package. Um, I now call upon a member to make a motion to accept the minutes of the last AGM. Thank you, Kathleen. And can I get a second? Thank you, John. So the uh, minutes of the 2022 annual general meeting as distributed to the membership has been moved and seconded. Uh, are you ready for the question? Any discussion? Not seeing any. All in favor, please raise your hand. And any opposed? Thank you, motion passed unanimously. Next is the chair's report. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Symphony Nova Scotia is a remarkable cultural asset that we can all be proud of. The symphony serves all Nova Scotians as a vibrant, versatile, and highly skilled musical resource, sharing inspiring experiences that foster well-being throughout our many communities. It is sustained by your patronage, your encouragement, and your belief in what we do. Our donors, audience members, corporate partners and government funders have ensured our longevity, and as we head into our 40th season, we're grateful for your support. We'd like to acknowledge corporate partners, Wilson Security, BMO, TD, O'Regan's, Jules Chamberlain and Nice Moves, Red Door Realty, and many other businesses who have valued how important arts organizations are to a thriving community. Family foundations include the Craig Foundation, A. Mary Holmes Trust, and River Phillip Foundation, to name just a few. They contribute annually to programming and activities. Also like to recognize Jason Roth and Cheryl Stedman Roth, whose generous gifts ensure diversity and inclusion educational activity throughout the season. We're especially grateful for the Symphony Nova Scotia Foundation for its ongoing support, and particularly this last year, for its assistance in the purchase of a new cello to be loaned to Rachel Desir, principal cello. Women for Music continues to be an important partner, and thank you to Shirley Jean Dean for her contributions to the board. New board members Zia Lawan and Barbara Means Thistle have completed their first term as directors. As a human resources specialist, Barbara has been instrumental in guiding new HR practices, and Ziad was especially helpful as we explored activity for young professionals. Congratulations are extended to board member Jane Gordon on her receipt of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee Medal. Jane was awarded alongside former board member Mary Lou McDonald and Adrian Hoffman for their tremendous volunteer contribution to our recently published book, Symphony Nova Scotia at 40, a milestone of musical history. And the launch was just a couple weeks ago and it was great, thank you for that. CEO Christopher Wilkinson and music director laureate Bernhard Geller were also awarded the medal. Chris, for his 10 years as CEO and 30 years of service to the symphony, and Bernard, for his contribution to the growth of the orchestra during his 16 years as music director. I'd like to thank the work of community members who continue to evaluate and measure various activity across the organization. Sincere appreciation is extended to Bob Whittison, who chaired the governance committee and has been working steadfastly on updating board policy and practices, as well as Nancy Bartow, who chaired the nominating committee. This was the final year of their board tenure, and we sincerely appreciate the many years of support they've provided. The 2022-2023 season was a cautious return, focused on rebuilding the concert-going habit of audiences with a broad range of appealing offerings and reactivating our history of inclusion 
innovation, and community outreach. I am grateful to my board colleagues, many of them are here today, for their support and thank the remarkable musicians, staff, volunteers, and audience who keep symphonic music live in this province. It has been a rewarding opportunity to lead this inspiring organization, and I look forward to serving as past chair. And now I would like to introduce Kathleen Franklin with the finance report. Thank you, Peter. So I'm very pleased to um, announce that we had a great return after uh, the pandemic and we were able to host uh, 49 concerts. Our normal season is six, uh, has 60 concerts. We operated for the entire 36 standard week. So that was great news. Um, we also, even though we did incur a deficit this year of 325000 it was far less than what we had budgeted for, which was another great um, achievement from, from management in and, and the, and the, and the, and the symphony. So um, I also want to just uh, say we continue to receive very generous support from both our private and our public donors. Um, we were very fortunate that from, uh, from the foundation that we were able to receive um, over a million dollars this year, and now they've moved into first place with our largest donor. And we continue to um, receive gener the generous support of the public funders with um, the uh, Canada Council for the Arts and uh, Arts Nova Scotia and the HRN. And those in total also accumulated $1.4 million. So we are very lucky to receive all this don donations um, to support our symphony going forward. Um, so as we continue to move forward um, through you know, and leaving the pandemic, we are very fortunate as well to have a very healthy reserve that we accumulated over the pandemic time with the wage subsidy. And that will be there to support our operations over the next number of years. So it's, it's $2 million now. And we did use a little bit of it this year, um, but there's still a healthy support there as the, as the uh, symphony continues to recover from the pandemic and grow in the future. So um, with that, I would like to uh, make a motion that the financial statements for the year ended um, June 30th, 2023 is um, approved as distributed. Can we get a second? Yeah. Second. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Who wants it? Okay. Yep. Max. 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 Yeah. All right. And I, I would also like to move that the... Oh, call me. So uh, all, yeah, all, all in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Motion passed. Thank you, Peter. Um, and I would also like to move that the firm of Grant Thornton be reappointed as auditors of the society for the next um, for the next fiscal year, 20, June 30th, 2024. And a second, please. Max again. Thank you. All in favor? Any opposed? Great. And I'd also, also like to take this opportunity um, to thank management for all of their hard work and the board. Uh, it, takes, it takes a big team to put on all this throughout the course of the year. And I know that their dedication and support throughout the years has contributed this to be another successful year. Thank you, management. All right. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for your report. Now I'd like to introduce Chris Wilkinson, the CEO, with the CEO report. Good afternoon, thanks for joining us. I'm pleased to announce that the first full season since 2019 was a success, despite the uncertainty as we headed into it. Many of you know we carried our season a year ahead and confirmed an annual operating budget in late winter before our current season has finished. Locking down guest artists, confirming repertoire, and building promotion campaigns demands advanced planning. Sometimes it's hard to remember that when we were planning our 22-23 season, the pandemic continued to range, rage and we were still in shutdowns. At the time, we couldn't anticipate audience return and we didn't know if more shutdowns might be necessary. We cautiously organized for a season that, in the end, exceeded our expectations. During the first six months, we carefully monitored how audiences were returning. Although public health rules allowed audience members to choose to forego wearing masks, 
We didn't relax safety pr protocols for our musicians and staff until after February 23. By the end of the season, our work was a bit more normalized. Having said that though, we do recognize that there are some patrons who are unlikely to return to live performances in the foreseeable future. And industry research confirms this at likely 10 to 20% of pre-COVID audiences. Still, those who attended this past season shared their appreciation for in-person concerts after three years of COVID interruptions. The most attractive programs for returning audiences are our fusion concerts, mirroring a trend that was noticed across the performing arts sector. After a two-year absence, we experienced record attendance at the Nutcracker. We also saw close to capacity houses for select spotlight concerts. But some classical concerts will continue to require significant marketing and community engagement to attract new audiences. Scaling up from community ensemble performances and sporadic live concerts to over 50 plus live performances, all within a condensed planning timeline, continuing health and safety concerns and lingering stress from the pandemic created significant strain on internal resources. I'm very proud of the musicians, staff and volunteers who worked diligently and creatively to bring the season to fruition. Our experience in this last season highlighted the required investment in tools, processes, and human resources to ensure we are providing a positive work environment. Finally, having a reserve fund provided a lifeline for the 22-23 season, equipping us with critical resources to support the orchestra and our programming as we re rebuild audiences and earn revenue. Overall financial stability, however, will continue to be a key focus, focus for Symphony Nova Scotia in the coming years. Hill Strategies research published earlier this year indicates the recovery of performing arts in Canada lags significantly behind other arts organizations, suggesting we may need up to three to five years to fully appreciate market response. Our sightline is through 2627 as we determine how quickly and by what means we can raise earned and private revenue to offset annual expenditures. I'd like to express my appreciation to the Board of Directors for their thoughtful oversight and guidance of Symphony Nova Scotia, and in particular, Peter McCaskill for his tenure as chair. As we look forward, we're confident we'll see a future where every Nova Scotian can experience musical expression and creativity as part of daily life. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for your report. I now call upon Holly Matheson to give the music director report. I hope you don't mind me reading from my laptop. I've not had a chance to print anything out yet. I've sort of went from playing to bed to rehearsal. So <laughs> uh, bear with me. Ooh, where should 2022 to 23 felt like the season we announced we're back on full throttle and doing something exciting and vital here. With a packed calendar of work across all of our series and for the widest audience possible. In the opening weeks of the season alone, the diary included a pop-up dance concert with the Nova Scotia Youth Orchestra at Ordinary Landing Market, a maritime fusion concert with David Miles, schools and outreach concerts, and a recording of our se second Jalasi session all alongside Symphony Week and the opening Spotlight concert. There was an energy and a buzz throughout the season that was set in those very first weeks. We started the Spotlight series with Beethoven's famous fifth, a little piece you might have heard of, the Fifth Symphony, a performance that showcased international cellist Inval Segev, playing a concerto by Anna Klein, presented in partnership with the Taki Allsop Conducting Fellowship, Marin Allsop's career-changing fellowship for women conductors. Highlights from other performances in the Spotlight series included the return of former Symphony Nova Scotia concertmaster, Robert Uchida, who performed Johannes Brahms's concerto for violin and cello with Joseph Johnson, which was heaps of fun. As a conductor, it was a huge pleasure to work with our soloists, not just because of their musicianship and technique, but because they all brought such different energy to the stage. Pianist Marc-André Amelin and violinist Andrew Wan had understated elegance and humility as soloists, playing with understated beauty that really drew the listener in. Sarah Davis Buchner and Kirsten Leong, on the other hand, were like firecrackers going off in the cone. Kirsten's technique was simply astounding, 
and had not only the audience, but also the orchestra spellbound. And recording the Florence Price Concerto with Sarah was like having a dance party on stage. She was utterly joyous and generous and playful with her playing, enjoying the theatre of the piece. Angela Cheng's Chopin with our guest conductor Jerry Lynn Johnson making her SNS debut was crystalline and pure. The orchestra was also really delighted to welcome guest conductor Andre Fair. In April, we produced Mendelssohn's Elijah, featuring the Symphony Nova Scotia Chorus and Halifax Camerata Singers, led by Jeff Judry. This was Jeff's final performance as the symphony's chorus leader, and it was presented to a nearly full house in one magnificent evening, followed by a reception to thank Jeff for his exceptional decades of service. The season's final concert, featuring Symphony No. 5 by Sibelius, the other great No. 5, with its immense monolithic chords at the end, might have been the decisive proclamation, however, that our organisation had risen above the pandemic challenges and could see a season of celebration just ahead. We achieved so much in the past season artistically, and I'm delighted to share that with you now. Stephanie Orlando was selected as the fourth Canadian composer to receive the Maria Anna Mozart Award. Orlando's work will be premiered in the 24-25 season, and this program is graciously, graciously supported by Dr. Jane Gordon. The Canadian Broadcasting Company recorded the orchestra performing Louise Farron's Overture No. 1, Florence Price's Piano Concerto with Sarah davis Buchner, Karen Sunebacher's Quirky, Born by the River, and The Phantom Bird of Han by Alice Pingyi Ho, our previous Maria Anna Mozart Award winner in honour of International Women's Day. Symphony guests with many SNS debuts included conductors Jerry Lynn Johnson and Andrew Crust, cellists Inbal Segev, Joseph Johnson, Chris Dirksen and viola de gamba player Eleanor Frey, violinist Andrew Wan, Mi'kmaq fiddler and singer Morgan Tony, vocalists Vicky St. Pierre, Daniel Okulich, Catherine McClellan, Carmen Ruby Floyd, Bronson Norris Murphy, Erin LaCroix, Cassie and Maggie, dancer Kaio Barisance and actor Jonathan Cohen. A huge list of debuts in one season. The Nova Scotia Youth Orchestra Wellness Program was launched, a first of its kind in Atlantic Canada, and I can say something that is not even dreamed of in the rest of the world, with an exceptional gift of $90,000 over three years from the Jane W. Murphy Foundation. SNS will be able to offer its students, student musicians an integrated approach to healthy music making. We launched the video recording the Jalasi sessions, I'm Finding My Talk with Rebecca Thomas on International Literacy Day, January 28, 2023. Mi'kmaq artist Pauline Young provided vibrant illustrations and composer India Gailey did the score and that was her premier uh, commission for us and I think her first orchestral score ever, which is an amazing thing for us to have been able to give her. She did a great job. The premiere of Moon Tides, a new KV265 science and symphony film by Jose Francisco Salgado, who was a delight to work with, scored by Order of Canada recipient John Astacio, who's one of the nation's premier composers in our annual side-by-side -side concert with the youth symphony musicians. The orchestra performed at Open Waters Festival in January 2023 with guest conductor Carl Hertzman. And Julia Wedman was named Principal Baroque Leader, responsible for our ongoing Baroque series and gave us incredible performances throughout the year. And as a conducting colleague, I just am so inspired by the work she does and feel pretty humbled to get to share the podium with her. She's an absolutely world-class musician. Tour destinations Last season included repeated spotlight performances in Wolfville, Lunenburg, Amherst and Dartmouth and that list at this meeting in a year's time will be considerably longer because we're about to embark on a huge tour. We saw the departure of several long-serving orchestra musicians including Suzanne Lemieux, Ben Marmon, Patricia Crichton, David Parker and Vinnie Brennan and we welcomed Casey Gronofsky, Danielle Johannes, Timothy Young, Gemma Jones and Aidan Russell to the orchestra. These young musicians are in the first years of their contract and must complete several steps before being offered permanent positions, but there is a very palpable sense of newness. They have an energy and a sound of their own that will no doubt form the core of the orchestra's musical identity for the next generation, which is just a wonderful thing to witness. 
in a year which has seen several of the country's orchestras face overnight closures and bankruptcies after experiencing a huge drop in audience numbers and funding after the pandemic, I almost feel like I need to apologize when I say it feels like we are thriving. There is a sense of purpose and energy throughout the organization that is exciting to be a part of and humbling to witness. For that, I extend my hugest thanks to our incredible board held by Peter Muscat. Peter McCaskill, our indomitable CEO, management and staff who have worked themselves to the bone to get the orchestra back on the stage with such vitality. To my colleagues on the stage who bring their feistiness and inventiveness to every concert we play. And to our audience and donors who we exist to serve and who have, backed, who have bucked every trend in the country. Bravi tutti to all of you. The outgoing season was the overture to what will, I hope, be an even, even more exciting season to come. Thank you. Thank you, Holly, for your wonderful report. And now I'd like to call on Tim Matthews to give the report from the Symphony Nova Scotia Foundation. Good afternoon. Over 30 years ago, the then leadership of this society had the foresight to establish a foundation. At that point, perhaps only two other orchestras in Canada had such an endowment. I was called upon to find out how to do it and to set it up. And I called a lawyer who was on the board of the Toronto Symphony Foundation and said, what's this all about? And he was very gracious to assist me. It started small, it stayed small for a while, and now it's very big. Uh, as was already mentioned, uh, in uh, the earlier part of 2023, the foundation was able to pay over to the orchestra $1,005,000. That was possible because of investment over many years, carefully chosen, and even despite 2022 and 2023 being extremely volatile and somewhat disappointing uh, in the investment markets. Basically what the foundation does is steward money that has been donated by supporters of the orchestra, either during their lifetimes or through bequests in their wills. It stewards money provided to us by a Canadian Heritage, a department of the federal government that matches private donations. And I looked up just to see how that had done over the years. Uh, the government of Canada has matched to the extent of $6,413,000 private donations made, particularly during the Listen to the Future campaign, but also subsequent to that. At the moment, the value of the portfolio, the endowment fund, is $18,555,000. It changes from day to day, as you can imagine. About 75% of that is in common shares in, in the stock market, both Canadian and US companies, which are blue, blue, blue chip, uh, very stable companies that pay good dividends. They produce an annual income of about $875,000. So the difference between that and the money we pay over to the orchestra has to be growth capital gains and the value of those shares. Uh, there haven't been many of those in the last year and a half. Uh, the world economy is in somewhat of a turmoil uh, because of higher interest rates, because of war, because of the pandemic recovery, because of uh, supply chain issues, all of which many of you are aware of from the news. A very large part of our portfolio is in Canadian banks which are probably among the most solid investments that you can find in the world. 
as interest rates uh, level off, as they will in the next year or so, and as they begin to fall again, as they probably will during our lifetimes, <laughs> the value of those shares will increase dramatically. About 25% of our portfolio is in things other than uh, common share equity, including guaranteed investment certificates. Anyone in the room who invests will be aware that now GICs are earning between 4 and 5%, which isn't a bad return. By law, the foundation has to pay 5% of the value of the endowment on an annual basis. We calculate that on a, a rolling average over three years to smooth out the ups and downs of the market. So we do depend on the increase in the value of the portfolio to fund that 5%, uh, because the 875,000, uh, simple math, is about 87.5% of what we have to pay. In addition to that, uh, because we have so much income, uh, which we pay out at different times of the year, we, we have high interest savings funds, which also pay close to uh, 5%. Uh, just for interest sake, over the past 10 years, the total return on investment, that includes the dividends and interest, but also the capital gains that have actually been realized, have averaged 7.5%. So you can see over a long period of time, if we earn 7.5% and pay out 5%, we're protecting against inflation, we're growing the fund by leaving 2.5% to be reinvested. And that's the strategy in the long term. I bring you greetings on behalf of uh, our chair, Denise Leahy, who uh, uh, is out of the country at the moment and unable to join us. And on behalf of the entire board, it's a talented group of people. Many past presidents of this society have become uh, directors of the foundation. And I can assure you, having observed it for many years, this is one of the strongest boards I have ever had the pleasure to serve on. And we're taking good care of your money. So that's the report from the foundation. Um, next on the agenda is the report from the nominating committee. It's chaired by Nancy Bartow, who has conveyed her regrets. And in her place, uh, Peter McCaskill will present that report. Thank you, Tim, for your report. Uh, for the generous support of the Foundation and for the ongoing stewardship of the Foundation Board. <clears throat> As Tim mentioned, Nancy sends her regrets and the nominating committee report I shall present. The, uh, the report was included in your material um, and it includes the following. The, um, uh, the committee is chaired by Nancy. It includes myself, Miley Graham Laidlaw, and Chris Wilkinson. First time nominees proposed to be elected to the 2023-24 Board of Directors on a one-year term include Michael Conway and Julia Kent. And you can see their bios and pictures. <laughs> Pointing it out for you, Michael. <laughs> nominees continuing for the second year of a two-year term in 2023-24 include Marco Sine, Hal Lewis, John McLeod, Mark Parkhill, and Jill Thomas Merrick. Nominees proposed to be re-elected to the 2023-24 Board of Directors on a two-year term include Dr. Jane Gordon, Ziad Lawan, Barbara Means Thistle, and Brian Rendell. And board members completing a two-year term in 2023 include Nancy Bartow and Bob Whittleston. And we thank them. The slate of officers for election to serve on the executive committee for the 2023-24 term include David Wilson as chair, Margaret Chapman as vice chair, myself, Peter McCaskill, as past chair, Kathleen Franklin as treasurer, 
and Miley Graham Lidlaw as secretary. The musician representatives elected by the players include the chair of the Symphony Nova Scotia Players Association, which I have is to be determined. No, it's Max. It's Max. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Yvonne DeRolle and Rachel Desor. And the women for music representative is Shirley D. So with that, um, I'll be looking to accept the nominating report as distributed, as well as the election of the officers and the election of the executive. Can I get a motion? Kathleen? Thank you, Kathleen. And a second. John? The question, Max? Yeah, just one question. Um, Rachel can't do it, so one of the positions for the musicians will be to be determined. So, so okay. I'm sure it won't matter at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so for the minutes, we'll yeah. correct that. Thank you, Carol. Okay. Any other questions on that? All right. Can I have a show of hands for all who approve? Thanks. Any opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank the nominating committee for their work. Um, I'd also like to recognize the report of the governance committee and its work to update the Symphony Nova Scotia bylaws. Included in your material sent prior to the meeting were the documents titled Symphony Nova Scotia Society Memorandum and Bylaws and the Symphony Nova Scotia Governance Bylaw Revision, dated October 10th, 2023. Um, bylaws were circulated, and I now ask for a mover. I see several there, but I'm gonna call on Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> so I move that the proposed changes to Bylaw 27 and 45B as presented by the Governance Committee of the Board of Directors, Symphony Nova Scotia. Thank you, Margaret, a seconder? Thank you, Jane. Uh, any questions? Not seeing any, so could I have the show of hands for all in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Unanimously passed. Thank you. I now ask that any business done by the board since the last AGM be ratified. Can I have a mover for that? Thank you, Margaret. I move that all acts, contracts, appointments, elections, and payments taken, made, and done by the directors and officers of Symphony Nova Scotia Society since the date of the last annual general meeting be hereby approved, ratified, and confirmed. Thank you. Can I get a second? Thank you, Shirley. Uh, any questions? Not seeing any. So all in favor, please raise your hands. Thank you. Any opposed? Not seeing any, motion passed unanimously. Thank you so much. And I think I'll move on to adjournment. <laughs> so first, uh, on a personal note, um, I just wanna thank um, all the members, and need everybody involved in the symphony for the privilege of being your board chair for the last two years. Um, I thank each of the musicians, the staff, the donors, I don't want to forget anyone here. Um, the audience, the volunteers, uh, everyone who makes the symphony so successful. Um, to my board colleagues, I thank you for your support and your dedication through, uh, uh, through the board meetings that, we, that we've had over the last couple years. I remember having the privilege a couple years ago, two years ago, um, to go up on the stage and to declare that we were back. Uh, that was after a couple years of the uh, pandemic, and, and I have to say it was it was a privilege for me to go up there. But um, it was it was great to be able to do that. It was great to see the reaction of the fans, of the of the musicians, of everyone embracing it. And I have to say that it's it's wonderful to hear all of these reports um, and to know that um, after a couple of successful years, um, we're in good hands for the future as well. So with that, I thank you all so much. And I now request a motion to adjourn. Nobody wants to adjourn. Look at that, they all want to go. I see Kathleen making a motion and Max seconding. All in favor, please raise your hands. 
Any opposed? Adjourned. Thank you so much, everybody.